Welcome back to Extreme Wednesdays with Dr. Creepen. <laughs> well, I laugh, but oh, this one is not going to be for everyone's taste. Don't ask me to describe it because it is insane. You will never have heard anything like this before. I can guarantee it. So, what clues do you have? Well, pecan pie. Pecan pie. Pecan pie. Who doesn't love a nice bit of pecan pie? Well, you won't believe what lengths this guy goes to to get some. Now then, my dear friends, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because I've got a crazy story to tell you that goes something like this. It was early afternoon when the old pickup pulled off the interstate and into the parking lot of the Blue Bird Diner. On the truck's driver's side door was a faded decal, advertising the services of Duggar's Plumbing and Repair. The driver, presumably Duggar, was tall, gangly and gaunt, toe-headed and freckled. He had been blessed with a big, dumb face of a corn-fed 13-year-old boy, though he was actually somewhere in his late thirties. He had a set of teeth too big for his mouth, so when not making a conscious effort to close his thick, fishy lips over his teeth, his incisors hung out over his bottom lip like an off-white picket fence. Duggar put the truck into park and killed the engine but remained belted in, still gripping the wheel, white-knuckled at two and ten. He sat this way for some time. Though the November afternoon air was crisp, beads of sweat stood out on his forehead and upper lip and pasted his flannel shirt to his lower back. Duggar wiped his sweaty palms on his lap and, laughing at some private punchline, he unbuckled himself and stepped out of the cab. He stretched his long, spindly legs and sucked in a lung full of the brisk air. His olfactory neurons picking up hints of cinnamon, of ginger, of anise and cloves. <sighs> Pecan pie, he muttered to himself and giggled. He then walked around to the passenger side and opened the truck bed toolbox. He selected a claw hammer, a rusted pair of pliers, a hacksaw, and a flat head screwdriver. Dropping the tools into a big orange bucket, crusted with a foul residue, he entered the diner. The little bell above the door tinkled flatly, but no one bothered to look up. The diner was full of exactly the type you'd expect in such an establishment. Families on vacation. A few out of town is struggling to choke down real coffee as a sad substitute for Starbucks. And, of course, truckers. Duggar walked straight up to the counter and took a seat on a stool. The waitress, whose name tag read Juanita, did not acknowledge him. She was preoccupied in the task of combining the dregs of three half-empty bottles of ancient ketchup into one. Task completed, she wiped her hands on her apron and flashed a toothy and insincere smile. What can I get you, hon? He can Duggan mumbled. Juanita turned the pie case and pried a slice of pecan off the tray. She dropped it onto a small, greasy pie plate and slid it in front of Duggar. You want coffee too? Duggar grunted in the negative. Juanita shrugged and made her way down the counter, filling mugs and making small talk with other patrons. She had barely made it to the far end of the counter when Duggar called out. Pecan pie. Oh, you like you some pecan, do you? She teased. Pecan, my, he said again. Juanita, now somewhat annoyed, 
turned to the pie case and offered up another slice. Dogger picked up the pie and crammed it into his face. Pecan pie, he said through a mouthful of pecan pie. Cornita stood before him, hands on hips. Boy, you got any dang manners? Pecan pie, pecan pie, pecan pie, he screamed, showering her with half-chewed pie. Juanita had moved past annoyance to a mixture of disgust and creeping dread. But she did as she was asked. She plopped the pie onto his plate, and he snatched it up so fast she was scared she might lose a finger. Last slice in the house, honey. You make that one last. Dugger had already shoved the last crumb into his mouth. <sighs> Peek on my... Now, hon, I just told you that was the last slice. <sighs> pecan pie. <laughs> you ate us out of pecan pie. How about some key lime? Banana cream? <sighs> pecan pie. Look, buddy, I don't know where you're from, what drugs you're on, or who you think you are. But I'm telling you for the last time, we don't have any more pecan pie. Duggar reached down to his bucket of tools and picked up the claw hammer. In the booth behind him, a milk toast father in shorts and sandals ushered his wife and kids outside. Duggar raised the hammer in his right hand, his left hand palm down on the counter, fingers splayed. He brought the hammer down hard on the middle knuckle of his index finger. The impact made near everyone in the diner flinch and wince. Bone popped through skin. Blood oozed up the wound like magma from a volcano. Pecan pie, he said. A man in a suit at the end of the counter took out his phone and began to discreetly record the scene. Two truckers hurriedly dropped cash on the table and shuffled out to their trucks. Juanita held a hand over her mouth in an attempt to remain calm and not vomit right then and there. She'd dealt with weirdos over the years, but... Oh, let me check in the back, hon. I'll get you a first aid kit, too. <sighs> Pecan pie. He replied. Juanita went back into the kitchen and asked Carlos, the baker, about the pie. <laughs> no more. More tomorrow. You don't understand, Juanita explained. We need some now. She led the baker to the kitchen door and pointed to Duggar, who had shoved the flat head screwdriver under his thumbnail and was twisting it around mumbling peek and by until he managed to pop it off. Hey, esta loco! Carlos whispered and crossed himself. I make another pie, but it's gonna take an hour. Well, get started, Juanita snapped. I'll, uh, I'll try and keep him occupied. Juanita approached Duggar who by this point had moved on to the pliers and removed all of his fingernails. Oh, hey, honey, uh, we're going to get you that pie. <sighs> Pecan pie, Duggar said, around the pliers, yanking out a tooth. <sighs> Pecan pie, Juanita affirmed. Oh, we're making that pecan pie right now. But it's gonna be about an hour. Oh, can I get you something else while you wait? <laughs> Pecan pie, he answered. Duggar then reached down for the hacksaw. Oh, honey, please, <laughs> Juanita begged. <laughs> Pecan pie, he replied. 
Duggar started working the blade across his wrist, skin flowering open, bloodless at first, then welling up crimson. Juanita turned away and gagged. The blade bit into bone with a nauseating sound. In a few moments, his hand was free of his arm sitting on the counter like some awful albino tarantula. Peek and buy, he said. The diner was thick with the coppery stink of blood. Most of the patrons had left, but there were still a few iron-stomached spectators waiting to see how things played out. Duggar sighed. Peek and buy. He put the hacksaw to work, cutting lengthwise through his forearm, in the space between the radius and ulna, from his jagged wrist towards his elbow. Juanita looked at the clock. Barely ten minutes had passed. Duggar reached the elbow and stopped. He pulled the saw from his arm with a slurp, then grabbed hold of the radius and pulled it towards himself like pulling the lever of a slot machine. There was a wet crack, and the bone lay horizontally on the countertop. He repeated this with the owner. With bones broken, he worked on peeling them from the skin. This done, he tossed the bone fragments into his bucket and was left with two long flaps of limp skin from the elbow down. A fleshy banana peel. <sighs> Pecan pie, he said. Juanita ran to the kitchen and pleaded with Carlos. Can't you hurry? Turn up the oven or something. See, see, I turned up the oven. He cranked the heat up to full blast. Juanita peeked out into the diner to check on Duggar. He had the claw end of the hammer in his mouth, business end against his upper palate. With a yank, the steel dug into the roof of his mouth, gouging two deep red furrows and snapping any teeth in its path. She ran back into the kitchen. We can't wait, she screamed at Carlos, pulling the oven door open and grabbing a scolding hot pie barehanded. She raced out to Duggar, now hammering the screwdriver into his gums, and dropped the pie in front of him. The skin on both her palms already a mess of angry, yellow-red blisters. Mmm, peek of my, he yelped, digging into the gooey, undercooked mess. He shoveled mouthfuls of the steaming slop into what was left of his face with his remaining hand. In mere seconds, he had finished it. Oh, vegan pie, Duggar croaked. Carlos was ready with the second pie. Again, Duggar blew through it in seconds. The third and fourth went just as fast. Carlos fed him the pies that were prepped, but had not yet made it into the oven. Duggar ate them raw with the same enthusiasm. Finally, there came a rest in the chaos. Duggar pushed the half-finished pan away from him, this one containing only the dry ingredients which Carlos had hastily threw together, and wiped his ruined mouth with a napkin only managing to smear blood and crumbs from one side of his face to the other. <sighs> Orange juice, Duggar said, with what might have been a smile had he any lips left. <laughs> Orange juice? Juanita parroted, puzzled. Duggar began to giggle. <laughs> Orange juice. Glad I didn't say pecan pie. <laughs> he continued giggling, doubled over, slapping his knee with his remaining hand. Wheezing and red-faced, 
his laughter turning to gags and croaks until he finally retched, spewing pie and blood all over himself and the floor. He stood, still chuckling, dropped a fifty on the counter and walked out of the diner. Juanita called in sick the following day. Well, I did warn you, didn't I? What a crazy story. I mean, who drinks orange juice after eating pecan pie? <laughs> well, never read anything quite like that before. Don't think I will do again. But it's only a short one, and I know you like uh, a bit more of me on a Wednesday evening. So, what I've done is I've gone into the archive, and I've found another crazy story for you. Now, this one will be familiar to my older listeners... But it comes from September of last year, so please stick around. But I think if you like that one, then you're definitely going to like this one too. Are you ready? Good. Another story coming up for you right now. We all need to escape the... Hoi polloi, the rudimentary normalities of everyday life, from time to time. But what price a double life? What would you be willing to pay, just for those moments of escape? We examine the price one man is willing to pay in tonight's story. Now, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax in whatever way makes you comfortable. And please join me and listen. The newspapers were right. Six whores murdered within the last five months. And yet hardly any police action or resources were being used to catch the killer. No one could, or would, claim the bodies. Nobody knew them. Nobody cared. And, for anyone who may have, they didn't want to be associated with a cheap skank from some run-down ghetto. The newspapers were right. Nobody felt compelled to speak for the dead. As far as they were concerned, there was no need for fear. This side of town was for right and proper people. There were more pressing issues to print on their front page. Nobody would miss them. Troy scoffed at the paper. Ridiculous, he thought. I can't believe this even made a headline at all. He was numb to such news. Having grown up with a father who stank of cheap booze and fornication, constantly arrested for the assault of his uh, companions and his own son, Troy had known the darker side of life since his formative years. His father was eventually thrown into prison, where his years of poor choices caught up with him and died behind bars because of one of his many diseases acquired. Troy was placed, then lost, in the foster care system, never staying in one house long enough to call it home, or make any real connections with anyone. 
barely making friends before being hauled off to a new family. Granted, his uh, short temper and spouts of physical rage may have worried some families. Most knew his backstory and thought perhaps the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Eventually, he learned how to fend for himself after much trial and error and managed to graduate high school with average, he would say decent, grades before striking out on his own job hopping until he became manager of a local factory that let him check out of his pay-by-the-week motel living situation. A noise brought him out of his reading. He glanced up to see his wife of twelve years. Rebecca was, in every sense of the word, plain. Plain, dull eyes. Plain, dry, dull hair. Even the way she walked nearly bored Troy to tears. Her only act of rebellion that seemed to stick out in stark contrast to her otherwise forgettable appearance was a slightly faded tattoo of a butterfly that sat on her shoulder blade. She was a loyal wife, though, and she made decent money as a masseuse. And she didn't even protest to his wishes to put off starting a family. Rebecca adorned an exceedingly ugly shawl and picked up her oversized purse. Do you need anything before I come home tonight? She asked, as she did every day before work. All he could manage was a shrug and a quick shake of his head. All right. I'll be home later than usual. I have a client who booked at the last moment, right at the end of my shift. He smiled a joyless grin her way. That's fine. I can catch up on some of my other work projects here. Or maybe he wouldn't. Who knew? While Rebecca was at work, Troy decided today would be a good day to cut loose feel some excitement again. He too had made his own appointment of sorts. If only she would leave. Rebecca got in her faded tan sedan and drove off. He let out a long, drawn-out sigh. Some days just never seemed to end before his night could begin. He went to his private closet. Rebecca was good about allowing him his own space, and grabbed his travel bag. Everything seemed to be undisturbed within, so now there was only one thing left to do. He picked up the phone and dialed. The Velvet Rose had always been a top-reviewed motel and fantasy destination. They offered a variety of services. Themed rooms, reasonable rates, and, best of all, a don't ask, don't tell, no questions asked policy. If you paid in full and didn't cause too much of a ruckus, None of the staff would bother you or your guests for the evening. The phone rang twice before the clerk at the front desk answered. He was friendly enough and was able to confirm his stay. One night in the whisper room, a room from which no sound could seep in, nor could escape from. Perfect. Upon his arrival 45 minutes later, Troy wasted no time setting up shop. A red bulb here, some bondage on the head and footboard, a whip on the nightstand, and his outfit laid out. He had about another 30 minutes before his appointment, so he decided to take a hot shower and soothe his aches away. The one thing his wife wouldn't do for him 
even given her skills in it. <laughs> Some masseur as she was. Troy put on his leathers, his mask, and slid into his dual identity. A task made easier by the mushrooms he grew in secret from his wife back home. As if waiting for the exact moment, the room buzzer rang out as soon as he slipped on the last of his uniform, breaking the silence of the Whisper Room. Showtime. This was the first time Troy had used a professional, but discreet, escort service. No pictures were offered on the website, just a questionnaire of your tastes and preferences. Any doubts about the woman they would send were swept away as soon as she herself swept into the room. The magic fungus had begun to work its magic. The room refused to sit still, and the colors and patterns seemed to come off the wall to engulf him. He knew that much of it was the drugs, but he didn't believe it took away from the beauty that opened the door. This woman was the complete opposite of his wife, or indeed, any of the women he had ever been with. The swing of her hips was fluid and sensual, far too natural to have been taught. Her deep blonde hair was long, straight, and shimmering. Her makeup was excessive, but very well done. The outfit fit her like a glove, exaggerating and yet complementing every curve. Even the way she looked at him made him forget how to breathe for a moment. His head was swimming, and his vision was alternating between hazy and intense, and it made the effect she had that much more appetizing. Remember, he thought, this is business, not a date. Even so, this woman had already excited him more than any other he had known in the past. And even being a stranger from the internet, he felt a familiar, comfortable vibe from her, and almost considered backing out. <laughs> Almost. There was no need for words. They went at each other like animals. Over and over again, they took turns being dominant. He letting her take control more often than not. This was efficient. She was wearing herself out faster. Soon, she would be too tired to carry on. And while the physical act was exciting, the thought of what was to come and the helplessness in her eyes is truly what drove him to press on. Sweat poured from their bodies and Troy was getting tunnel vision. After they were done, he lay on top of her and looked upon her, while her eyes were closed as she panted to catch her breath. It was now or never. With one hand, he pressed it down firmly on her mouth, as the other hand reached for the knife he had put beneath the mattress. The woman's eyes shot open, and they caught the glint of silver approaching her neck. She tried to let out a wail of shock and fear. This was Troy's favorite sound. He felt closer to his father every time he heard it. Is this what he heard when he was off on one of his uh, escapades? Was this how they felt when they realized what sort of monster they'd hopped into bed with? His father had more rudimentary methods, but Troy could not help but feel they were connected in that moment and in the elation of what was to come. The knife came to her neck and began to bite into her flesh. She kneed him in the groin, 
but didn't have the leverage to make it count for much. She managed to roll onto the floor and gasp for air, the choking having been effective in sapping her already low energy. She started to crawl towards the door, letting out dry, raspy wails. It was in vain. This was the Whisper Room. It lived up to its promise. No one came to her anguished wails for help as the blade penetrated her spine, her kidneys, and her lungs. Her body seized for a time, and then was still and silent. Troy's heart raced and his blood ran hot. Her final screams would not be forgotten. He decided to pose her body more elegantly than the others. It was then, as he began to pick her body up, that the blonde wig she'd been wearing fell off, revealing a head of plain, dull, dry hair. He froze. The obvious thought that crossed his mind was quickly wiped away by his attempt to convince himself that it was just a coincidence. <laughs> Rebecca was at work. This was some rather expensive whore from a distant town from a discreet website. He would turn this escort's body over and his worry would be unfounded. The sweat and blood had wiped away the makeup revealing a plain, dull face. A coloured contact lens had fallen out during the struggle to reveal one plain, dull eye. If he could ever have convinced himself otherwise, it was made clear what he had just done when one of her shoulder straps, made weak from the attack, snapped. The faded tattoo of a butterfly rested on her shoulder blade. Troy immediately sobered up from his drug-induced haze. He let out a cry that could have awakened the dead. Rebecca did not wake, nor did any of the neighbors in the adjoining rooms. No one ever heard the wails coming from the whisper room. The newspapers were wrong. This whore would be missed. <laughs>